Do you believe in the power of prayer? Has God answered your prayers? Do you need prayer right now? I want to ask you, would you please leave a prayer request under the comment section? I want to pray for you. I really mean that. I will pray for you. And I need you to pray for me. We're going to look today at a great subject in regards to the Bible, Jesus cursing the fig tree. What does this mean? Why did Jesus curse the fig tree? How does this apply to you and me? You know what? When I was a teenager, I used to think that I was as good as anybody else, and I could go to heaven because of my goodness. I thought it was what the outside that mattered, not really on the inside. I was wrong. And until later, as a 21-year-old young man, I understood that it's the inside that Jesus changes. Man works from the outside in, but Jesus works from the inside out. We're going to see today this cursing of the fig tree, figs, faith, and future. Or put it another way, explanation, illustration, and application. And call a friend, hit the subscribe button, leave a comment, and especially a prayer request. And we appreciate you joining us. Here is a fig tree. And our Lord, along with his disciples, in the last days of his life, walks by a fig tree. You know what he does? He curses it. Why did he curse it? What does this mean? Does this have a symbolic meaning? I want you to look at that fig tree because fig trees were told by scholars such as uh, John Walbert and Roy Zuck. The figs come out on the tree before the leaves do. Now all of a sudden you're going to get the picture. Because we're going to look at the text in Matthew's gospel and in Mark's gospel and see this account where Jesus curses a fig tree. But before we do, I want to remind you about Matthew's gospel. Matthew is writing, being a Jew, to portray our Lord Jesus as the king of the Jews. I know that because chapter 2, the wise men said, we're coming searching for the king of the Jews. I know that because Matthew 1 Matthew records the genealogical line of our Lord and traces it back to Abraham and David. Why? Because he wanted his readers to know that Jesus Christ was indeed a Jew. Also, remember over the cross where Christ died for our sins was written, Jesus, King, or here, King of the Jews. And so let's go right into this description and do some explanation and illustration and application and see how it applies to us. Now, in the morning, this is the last days of our Lord's life, he had been at Bethany with his friends, Martha and Mary and Lazarus, and now he's going back to Jerusalem. In the morning, as he returned to the city, he hungered. You know, Jesus was both God and man, fully God, fully man. As much man if he were not God, as much God if he were not man. He was hungry, but at the same time, he said, I'm the bread of life. In John chapter 6 and verse 35, he was thirsty on the cross, but he said, Oh, if any man thirst, let him come and drink. John chapter 7, verse 37 and 38. He was weary, and he sat down at the well of Sychar in the book of John chapter 4, and yet he said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You shall find rest for your soul. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. You're weary today. I'm probably speaking to a lot of people that are tired and stressed and I prayed with a lady just a few hours ago that said she'd had a stroke and her blood pressure was shot sky high, and she said, I need prayer. Just after I prayed with her, I talked with one of our men, 86 years old, prayed with him. I was at the hospital yesterday with one of our men who had total knee replacement. Prayer, the prayer of faith. Notice how this connects with this cursing of the fig tree. He went to the city, and when he saw a fig tree in the way, He came to it, found nothing thereon but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever, and presently the fig tree withered away. Mark also records this. You notice on the morrow they came from Bethany, and same account. Well, what happens? And why did Jesus curse this fig tree? Well, again, the figs would show up on this tree before the leaves would, according to scholars. And so Jesus had every right to expect figs to be on the tree because the leaves were there, but there was no figs. In other words, it was producing, but not producing. In other words, I believe this is a symbolic 
message of Israel. Israel had a form of godliness. You remember Paul said that to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He said they'll have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. In the last days, perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own self, covetous, bolsters, proud, disobedient to parents. I'd say we're living in those days. Unthankful, unholy, without natural affections, truce breakers, incontinent, fierce, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. So, this is a picture of Israel. Now, I want to explain how this fits in the overall scheme of things when it comes to the Bible. Where does Israel fit in? Where do the church fit in? Did the church replace Israel? No. One thousand million times, no. Well, what did Jesus mean when he said that he cursed this fig tree? Did Israel put their faith and trust in Jesus when he came offering the kingdom and the gospel of Matthew? We'll see. But did, did that nullify his unconditional covenant he made with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 to chapter 15? Also, the Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel 7, verse 14 through 16. The new covenant, Jeremiah 31. The land covenant, Deuteronomy chapter 30, 31. No, it didn't negate or nullify any of these covenants. It did postpone them, however, because they rejected the kingdom. Let's see what we mean when we're talking about that. All right, so... This ties in with faith, too. When disciples saw this fig tree which had been withered, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig withered away? Jesus answered and said to them, Verily I say unto you, If you have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also you shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed, be cast into the sea, and it shall be done. All things which you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. I like that. What a great promise of our Lord. But, but how does this fit together with a fig tree? I believe, again, the Lord is showing us this is symbolic of Israel because they were religious, but they didn't have a relationship with God. Maybe you know somebody right now, or maybe you're watching right now, and you, you just kind of go through the motions. I know a lot of people tell me they pray, and they go to church, and they read their Bible, but they've never repented and turned from the sin and asked Jesus to save them. You see, I used to think that I was good enough to go to heaven, because I didn't do all these things, but I did all these things. But the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. That's in Romans 3.10. And thus Jesus Christ, the God-man, came to live a life without sin, something I couldn't do, to die for my sins and pay my sin debt. And I have a choice. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Here, Jesus Christ is without sin, dying for my sin, paying my penalty. Here I'm guilty of sin, and the penalty must be paid. It's the lake of fire. Unless I say, Jesus, I put my sins on you, trust in your shed blood to forgive my sins, save me. Have you done that? Let me tell you about Israel. Paul said God's not finished with them yet. That's Romans 9, past tense Israel. Chapter 10, present tense Israel that his brethren should be saved in future tense, chapter 11 of the book of Romans. And so God has a plan for Israel. But now I'm fixing to introduce to you the gospel of Matthew. We just went right into this chapter 21, the last days of our life, uh, the last days uh, of our Lord's life, should I say. But now we're going to see the first days of his life after he had been baptized by John, the Jordan River. Then he goes and Choose his disciples, sends them out. You know what he told them to do? He told them to go to the house of Israel. But they didn't believe, and by faith, many of them, by and large, Israel didn't put their faith and trust in him. They were looking for a political ruler, a king, instead of a spiritual king. He's going to set up his kingdom one day. And uh, I'm going to skip over this because we just read that. That was uh, Mark's uh, account. But look at this. From that time, this is Matthew chapter 4. I'm Going back now, Matthew says, Jesus began to preach and say to, the, to repent. That time began Jesus preached, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or the kingdom of God. He was going to set up his kingdom. It's been postponed. He's going to set up his kingdom where he literally, physically, visibly rules and reigns in Jerusalem on his throne, and he'll establish his covenants with Israel. But here's what happened. He says to the disciples, 12, he sent them forth, commanded them, saying, go, not into the way of the Gentiles and into the city of the Samaritans. Enter you not, 
but go rather to who? The lost sheep of the house of Israel. That was his focus. And look what they were to do. They were to go and preach the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Would they believe it? No, they rejected it. So what did happen to them? Here's Matthew 21. Fast forward after Jesus sent them out and they rejected it. They rejected the prophets. They rejected the message. Therefore, I say to you, Jesus is speaking to the Israel. Remember, Matthew's gospel is before the church is formed in the book of Acts. And he says, the kingdom of God should be taken from you and given to a nation, ethnos, bringing forth the fruits thereof, Matthew 21, 43. Luke also records the thing, same thing. Well, what did he mean by that? Here's what he meant by that. Peter comes to Jesus in Matthew 19, 28 and says, we followed you, what are we going to get? You know, Peter, a Jew. And here's what Jesus said. He's talking about in the future. Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me, speaking to the disciples, Jews, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory, you shall also sit upon the twelve thrones, thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Notice the word regeneration is paleogenesia. It's only used two times in the New Testament. It means recreation or renewal. It means when Christ comes again, the Lord is going to allow these to sit on and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. God's got a plan for Israel. That's the point. They rejected him. The fig tree was not producing fruit, and it was cursed. Yet the Lord says, I've got a, another nation. Here's the word nation, ethnos. And Peter's now writing to Christians. The church had been established in the book of Acts. Now we're fast forwarding to the first Peter. Your chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy ethnos, nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praise of him who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Here's the bottom line. God has a plan for the Jews, Israel. God has a plan for the church. Don't confuse the two. Now, yes, Jews and, can, and Gentiles now can be a part of the church, but before the church was established, the Lord had a message to the Jewish people all the way from Genesis, from Abraham on, and even the church as established as of now when Christ comes for his church. So what does faith have to do with all this? Remember figs, faith, and future? Jesus said, what sort of things you ask, believe, and you should receive. And that doesn't mean we get everything we want when we want it. Rather, it means instead we pray for the will of God. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. This is the confidence we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition we desired of him. Jesus said, ask and it should be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it should be opened unto you. Whosoever asketh, receive it. He that seeketh, find to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. That's Matthew 7, 7 and 8. Whatsoever should ask the Father in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. That's John 14, 13 and 14. And John 16, 14. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name, asking you to receive that your joy may be full. Remember what Jesus said in that Matthew 18 context, if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, they shall ask, it shall be done for them, my Father in heaven. Where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst of them. I want to pray for you in a moment, but wait a minute. Let's talk about faith. Is faith hocus pocus? Is it just believing, you know, maybe so, Perhaps so, no. Faith is the eye that sees invisible. Faith is the heart that believes incredible. Faith is the hand that receives impossible. In other words, the biblical definition is faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. That's Hebrews 11.1. 1. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. That's Hebrews 11.6. The just shall live by faith. So here's the point. The point is this, that when we pray, we need to pray in faith. Faith according to the will of God. Faith is taking God at his word. And we can take him at his word right now. He's been faithful and true to provide, to fulfill his promises. As we look at the Bible, oh my, Jesus' first coming, his second coming is imminent. And that is in the rapture, his coming in the rapture first, then the tribulation, the second coming of Christ. The Lord will establish that withered fig tree. Zechariah says, they shall look upon him whom they pierced and mourn. And all of Israel will be saved in a day. That's Zechariah 3, 9. That's Zechariah 12, 10. Romans 11, 25 and 26. All of Israel should be saved. When they turn to their Messiah, the one they projected, when he sits on his throne in the millennial reign, 
Christ will come again. Are you ready for the coming of the Lord? I want to ask to pray for you now, and please leave a comment how I can pray for you. We believe in the power of prayer. And I want to pray now, Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come to you that you've got a plan for us, as you do have a plan for your people, Israel. And we want to get in on that plan. Lord, I know there's many perhaps watching today that don't have a relationship with you like I thought that I could be good enough and you'd weigh out my good over my bad. I pray today you'll open hearts and you'll open eyes and you'll quicken your word in hearts and many will come to know you in a personal way. And I'm asking you, Father, for those that do, that some are weary and tired and maybe some depressed, some discouraged. I just ask you, Father, to refresh us and revive us and renew us to keep holding forth and marching forward. Cleanse us, use us, fill us, we pray now. And we bless you. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for your precious blood. And even so come, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please leave a comment and hit the subscribe button. Let us know how we can pray for you. God be with you till we meet again.